Right, I'm going to talk about achieving a low glycemic response diet within a food-based approach to healthy eating. The presentation is going to be mostly many analytical reviews that I'm looking at, and the financial support is from BNO. BNO do produce quite a number. Vino do produce quite a number of, of carbohydrate ingredients, uh, so there's some in interest there. The things which we, uh, which the people who have co uh, covered us in the past are, are very varied, very, very numerous over the last five years. And one thing I should say, and without having to read them all out, is that many of them are, are interested in ingredients. We have a policy at InLogic that we do good science. Of course, all science is good. Um, if it's not good, it's not really science. But it stands alone in a part irrespective of the funding, funding source. That's one of the principles we work on. And therefore, we hope not to uh, confuse uh, and mislead the general public in any work that we do and uh, endeavor to uh, approach that. So I'm going to be speaking quite a lot about uh, food-based advice and how to achieve a low glycemic index diet. And it's really quite important that we don't really speak about just a low glycemic index diet as, as being a, a, sort, a, a sort of diet. There are many types of diet that can be low glycemic index. But what very often national food authorities will do is that they will say things like um, eat five a day fruit and veg or more than that or various other foods. And the question is whether these are optimal for our health. Of course, the idea of giving that advice is that it's optimal for health. So what we'll be doing is having a look at some of the um, food-based advice and asking if it is optimal for type 2 diabetes and coronary heart disease. I'll give you what my thinking is, but there's still a question mark there. I want to look at another component to say, well, if it's not just food-based advice, should be looking at components of foods. And I look, want to look there at the protein content of the diet. Is that important? And I think I'll be suggesting yes, but this question mark. Is there a role for novel carbohydrates and, and prebiotics, examples of isomaltulose and inulin? And I think there, again, the answer is going to be yes, but again, there's a question mark. And is there evidence of effectiveness across the continuum from healthy individuals to uh, those who are already, uh, say, diabetic or already have heart disease? And I think, again, the answer is going to be yes, there is. But again, there's still a question mark. So turning now to glycemic index um, is not needed. This is often uh, a, a comment that, that I hear, because if you have healthy food, uh, then you, you'll be eating a low glycemic index food. So I decided that I'd really have a look at this and see whether it's true or not. And we tend to attach positive messages to some foods and negative messages to others. So is it true or false? Well, some years ago, in 2006, it was already evident to me that, for example, things like fruit and vegetables, uh, particularly legumes and whole grains, um, are the sorts of foods which uh, we want to talk about amongst others, which I'll come to, uh, and that they do in fact have some differences, but they're only small differences compared to the very wide range of glycemic indices that you can get for these particular foods. Now, if what we do is bring these together, this is called an adjustment, so we can look at the remaining variants after taking account uh, of the differences between the foods. And instead of just looking at these three foods, we can add to them the other ones with a positive message and those with a negative message. And once we've done that, then we come up uh, with about 700 foods there. And quite surprisingly, uh, they all seem to fit a rather similar curve. But the most important point to note is that after adjusting for those, there's still a very large variation in the foods. Well, that's all well and good. But it's great for those who want to design, as David Jenkins once did do, uh, particularly with fruits, to say, well, does it matter whether you consume a low glycemic index fruit or a high glycemic index fruit? 
and his studies uh, for Marcusol in diabetes suggested that, that it did matter. But are these differences real for all, all the other things? For that, we can only re start to look at an, analysis, at an analysis of the variants. And for our information, we take from the uh, international food tables for our GFI, GI values, but there's also information there on the variants of those determinations. So that's with determination within, within the laboratory. And of course, there's variation between laboratories or among laboratories, and there's variation among, among, among the foods. And what we really want to get at is this variation among foods. And we can express this as a residual heter heterogeneity, which is called I squared. And when we do that for glycemic index, we, first of all, if we have, if in model zero there, we have no food groups which we uh, say is predicting uh, a difference in glycemic index, uh, then we find that 80% of the variance uh, in the GI values in the tables for these 700 foods is, is unrelated, sorry, is, is related to the differences in the foods. If now we try to explain that by adding fruit groups, for example, fruit and vegetables, that's the very simplest the very simplest model that people generally get to hear of, and it's the most common one that, that we hear of, and that's without necessarily making a difference between the types of vegetables, which most, uh, most people don't know about. It actually makes no difference to explaining the heterogeneity amongst these foods. We can add now starchy vegetables to make a di distinction in the model between uh, low starchy vegetables and high starchy vegetables, and it made no difference. Now, whole grains is really quite important, we hear, but again, it makes very little difference. When you start adding other things like low fiber cereals, legumes, and dairy, then you get uh, an influence. And for adding further things such as uh, vegetables, uh, where you start differentiating the colors as they do in the States, um, then there's very little, very little carbohydrate uh, in those, and it's going to make very little difference. Now that's for glycemic index. So it doesn't look like the uh, food-based models are going to tell us much about changing the glycemic index. Here we now have for the glycemic load, and look at it, 96% gets improved as for, and the best models down to 86%. So I think the overall conclusion I've got from that is that these, the models that we have for food-based advice given out by national authorities are not really telling us much about the glycemic index of the foods. And so we need to add something to what is already being done. And that has to be uh, some element of uh, glycemic index or glycemic load or glycemic response, whichever uh, is found appropriate for circumstances. I want to look at other things now, like protein. So already we've got these uh, glycemic index, glycemic load, etc., which is rather different sort of information, useful information, additional to food-based advice. What we do in epidemiological studies very often is, is we'll split up the uh, population that we've sampled into, say, uh, best five cohorts, and we'll express the uh, relative risk, and there's a risk in a specific cohort over some reference cohort, which might be the lowest or the highest uh, cohort, uh, highest, uh, uh, cohort with the highest or lowest risk. And what, what we use this uh, relative risk for um, is that in the lower value tends to normalize for an unspecified range of regional factors and confounders, uh, which sometimes uh, we at attempt to uh, correct for. But if we're mixing studies from different regions, and all <coughs> these factors are still uh, hindering our attempt to assess what, the what impact they will have. And so we can now go to a pool cohort. So we don't pull data from studies, we pull, we'll just pull all the cohorts and re-express the relative uh, risk as being the cohort from the lowest or the highest risk within all the cohorts that takes happen. And we can do this now for uh, glycemic index and, and, glyce and uh, protein or I should say the protein energy ratio. And when we do this, we come to what is, for me, some rather astounding findings that uh, globally, uh, the relative risk is really quite large. We're used to speaking of, of relative risk changes of 1.2 or 1.3, 1.4, perhaps 1.6. But here we're talking of potentially globally of tenfold for type 2 diabetes um, or higher for uh, coronary heart disease. Now, I should express here why we have this determinant in its particular form, which is glycemic index multiplied by the uh, inverse of protein energy ratio. And it's simply that glycemic index, as it increases, is a positive relationship with risk. 
Whereas the protein is a negative relationship with risk and we can't have it pushing in different directions. We've really got to put the two together, forcing in the same direction. And this doesn't necessarily say that it's the protein or the energy that's the critical issue, but there's some interaction between glycemic index and some other part of the diet, which is either protein, energy, it might be uh, even that there's a, uh, an interaction between glycemic index and, and dietary fat as well as the carbohydrate that's present. So that's quite interesting, and I'm looking forward in the future to um, expanding upon that. If I can move on now to uh, other things, well, this is the one we did a little while ago, saying uh, here we are up to 1.8 globally for our glycemic load. And something that Simon showed earlier on that I always like to keep showing because an editorial said that um, glycemic load has no significant effect in men. Well, this slide on the right hand side tells you that it does. And that the, there is a sex difference. And if you have a mixed population, then you get intermediate results. I want to speak now to isomodular. So we've got, we've got glycemic index, we've got protein as being components of the diet but that we need to think about additional, it seems to me, to our food-based advice. We've heard a lot about it. It's low glycemic compared with sucrose. It's only half the glycemic index of sucrose. There are six trials that, will, uh, that tell us that about 95% or, or more of the isomodulose is, is absorbed. The 35 trials telling us that there's a reduced blood glucose response, 25 trials showing a reduced insulin response, six trials showing a reduced fasting triglycerides, and six trials suggesting an elevation in fat oxidation. Um, those with the probabilities are things, are probabilities we've ob observed ourselves from uh, meta-analyses. Meta uh, but I'm, I'm sure there are more studies that we can add. Those were uh, systematically taken from from uh, Medline um, and, and Embase. Looking at isomolculose, um, what we can tell you is that when this is given at, at various doses from 17 up to, up to, does this work from 17 up to 50, then there may even be a dose response reduction uh, in, in, fasting, in fasting blood glucose. It isn't large, but it does seem to be, well, it's bearing on the significance. But there are not enough studies to, to tell us that there really is a, a, a dose response. There's an effect uh, in, in diabetics, which is in the same direction, possibly a little bit more, but not enough yet to tell us that it's significant. But overall, there is a, a significant uh, influence. Looking now at the difference in insulin resistance, mostly this is, is over IR uh, for uh, isomortulose. Um, there's not, not really a lot happening uh, for non-diabetics. Non one study in type 1 diabetes suggesting an effect uh, and it's rather mixed results for type 2 diabetes. But notice these are uh, poorer studies in the sense that they're uh, much more variable and tell us very little more. But overall, there's a significant effect. And if we combine the whole, even if we combine the whole lot, there's a significant uh, reduction uh, in, in HOMA score. Turning now to fructans, and I'm looking at inium oligofructose and fructo oligosaccharides, I'm not differentiating between those. Uh, so we can keep uh, sufficient numbers of observations. Uh, here, if we replace a carbon <coughs> and available <coughs> carbohydrate with, with, with any of these fructans, <coughs> then we don't really see any, any improvement uh, in the fasting blood glucose amongst individuals who are non-diabetic. There's a range of different metabolic states, some of them healthy, but um, the overall <coughs> picture is there's not a lot going on there. But once you get to the uh, type 2 diabetics, then you do find an effect, and it is noticeable that those with the largest effect are those with the greatest uh, severity of diabetes, which is something that we've found before. So it does look like that there is a, a, a role for uh, the novel carbohydrates and the, uh, and the prebiotics. If we go one step further uh, on that last point, that, uh, there is even with individual studies here, you can see that there's the change in fasting blood glucose does depend on the severity of their diabetes. We can see that in some cases, um, if we look at all our studies together, there are 20, 23 normal, 23 in total, and six which are in, in, in diabetes. That all studies together, um, there's a relationship to get, <coughs> with increased in blood glucose, that it, then, then the effect gets, gets bigger, the negative that tells us that the blood glucose is going down. You get the uh, effect with prebiotics and those which are only prebiotics, but also with symbiotics. Uh, where the uh, fructan is provided with various microorganisms. 
Uh, of course, there are only a few numbers of studies, studies there. Uh, so it does hint at the, 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 one of the possible effects of the, of the uh, fructans is to support microorganisms in the gut, but that's, that's only suggestive. <coughs> I've shown this figure here. This is the determinant, if you like, fasting blood glucose minus 5, which is about normal. If you square it, then you get uh, a reduction in the heterogeneity, which tells us really that, that this relationship is not linear, that it's, that it's curvilinear. And, that, and that, uh, there are other ways, and we do know that remaining variants, you can remove some of that by an even better modeling of those relationships. Okay, treatment with fructans, uh, with, now we're looking at insulin resistance amongst all these studies. Uh, it does seem that there is some improvement in, in uh, insulin resistance, that it decreases both in non-diabetics and, and in diabetics. The influence in diabetics does seem to be uh, rather variable in individual studies and doesn't turn out to be significant individually, but is bearing on the age of significance uh, when, when we start combining studies. But there are only two studies there, and it would be nice for us to see more of those. And my last point is that, um, is that I do feel um, that in addition to uh, GI protein, some of these novel carbohydrates and prebiotics being uh, either especially helpful or, 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 or marginally helpful, uh, that um, although we see nothing happening down here when blood glucose is, is having, it, it is very low. Can't get this one to move on. Oh, there we go. When blood glucose is very low, this is a range from uh, non-diabetics up to severely diabetic individuals showing that uh, glycemic index will, will lower the blood glucose response and that it's a great, greater absolute reduction uh, in those with greater absolute severity of, of the disease. But that happens as we get older. And the way I look at it is this, that if you're diabetic, you can, you can get uh, some improvement and demonstrate it. And if you're non-diabetic, you hope that the future in your life, as it gets, uh, you, you stop yourself getting worse and you never ever see an effect with these things. But that doesn't mean to say they're having no effect whatsoever in the body. It's just that you can never pick it up easily. And that you need to have long-term long studies if you want, want to do that. Now, I'm going to say finally on this one, I'm going back to the slide that I had. You've seen it before. There are question marks on it and we've done something to help remove some of those, some of those question marks. So that's the direction which I think all this is leading. <coughs> and finally, I would like to thank all these people who have been support, encouraging, very supportive, even if it's just a one-word answer, to, like yes, to a question. Uh, sometimes a yes means that they are letting, letting themselves in for a lot of work. Um, quite a number of people who have been very helpful, and I'm very pleased to, to have had their, their support. And um, that's the end. Sorry, folks. Um, but thank you very much for uh, lending me your ears and being attentive.